Oh, the microphone went down. Oh, there we go. Hey, we had extra seats at 8 a.m. You guys could have come, found your seat easily. We got a couple here on the front. Uh, and donuts, but those ran out. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that. Uh, hey, shout out to Campbell and Union. Hopefully you guys are partying over there as well. It is good to be together. And uh, I say this every Easter, even though it doesn't actually happen, but I'm going to say it again nationwide. You know, the week after Easter, attendance is cut in half, right? But I'm idealistic. I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, we celebrate the resurrection every single Sunday. And so we would love for you to come back next week and want to let you know we're kicking off a series called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. And uh, we're navigating specifically the area of mental health. This has unfortunately been rampant for several years across uh, uh, generations. Uh, many of you know that I went through this in a personal journey uh, the past year. And so our goal is to encourage and equip and be the church that works on the front lines of meeting people where they are, connecting them to the right resources, and uh, just giving you hope. And so we'll be uh, navigating that series the next five weeks. Another thing I want to mention before we jump into the message, a little bit more internal, um, but you might not know we operate on a 50-week budget. And the reason why is so that we can be as flexible as possible with our Easter and Christmas offering. Ideally, we want to uh, assess all needs of uh, opportunity for impact locally and internationally, so we prayerfully consider and discern uh, where we uh, can give that money away. So if you do give this Easter, uh, the offering will go toward uh, three different entities, 25000 toward a church plant in Lake Nona, Florida. Uh, for those of you long-timers, you know our previous lead pastor was Greg Marksbury. He planted a church almost eight years ago there in a really difficult area to have a thriving church. In fact, in the Lake Nona area, there's uh, that proper area, of, there's about 100,000 people and only one church building. So they've been setting up, tearing down, meeting in schools and doing that hard work in the trenches the last seven and a half years, finally bought land and then a few years we'll be able to build on that. So we want to bless them and hopefully do more in the future. Uh, that's 25,000. The next 50,000 will go toward uh, a village off the Kenyan coast called Chumani. And uh, we, we showed video, or pictures of this uh, a couple weeks ago, and we'll talk more in the future about it. But for the sake of time today, we have a longtime partner in Missions of Hope International. Uh, they do just a fantastic strategic job of merging uh, st students, um, schools, and, uh, and churches. And so this specific area, a largely Muslim area, there's 300 students on a waiting list to get into uh, the school. So over the course of time, uh, they're going to build uh, that school and uh, a lot of the, the students' parents already attend uh, the local churches there. The next 75,000 isn't as exciting, uh, heads up, at least in the short term, but hopefully in the long term. 75,000 is going to go toward debt retirement. This is the lowest our debt has been since the 1990s. And so we want to be con continue to be aggressive and assertive in paying that down, paying it off, so that I can one day, hopefully soon, stand up here and just tell you about church plants and an opportunity for kingdom impact around the world. And so that's just going to give us an opportunity to accelerate our mission here. Uh, anything given beyond 150000 will go toward our fall initiative called Practicing the Way, uh, where we intentionally uh, navigate different spiritual practices. Uh, there's a lot more to be said here, but we're not the church that you show up to and, you know, maybe, you know, have the fog machines and the lights. You know, we do all that kind of stuff and the big. Uh, we're about spiritual depth, right? I'm not saying other churches aren't. I'm just saying we sacrifice a lot so that we can embrace the slow the intentional, but especially the highly relational of creating environments where people can walk alongside of each other, journeying through life, postured toward depth in Christ. And so being formed into Christ-likeness, especially if you first-time guests, that's what we're about. All right, so in thinking about why we are here today, uh, we can't just jump into the reality of the truth that we celebrate. We also have to understand that there's no resurrection without death. There's no resurrection without first death. And so we had several people at our Good Friday service uh, two days ago where we, all we did was we sat in the weight of the reality of why Jesus went to the cross because of our sin that separates us from God. All of us practically have lived out to a certain extent that our greatest grief comes from death. The loss of a loved one represents finality, the end of something good. I'll never forget uh, the, the first time I felt that deep grief as a child when my grandpa passed away and went to the funeral, and it was a paralyzing moment, and wrapping my mind around like, this is it, uh, something is not right with this world. This is good things like this should not come to an end. So death feels, seems so hopeless because it's so final. 
And so Jesus made the decision to go to a cross, to die on that cross. And naturally, his, his closest followers were buried in grief. Like, wait a second, this isn't how it was supposed to go. But then three days later, he changed that narrative. And he declared that death does not get the final say. And that's why we're here today. Resurrection Day to celebrate the hope that we have in Jesus. And this is for everyone. And here's what we can say because of that truth. 1 Corinthians 15, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, again, I'm Easter, because there's literally more than double the attendance, right? Uh, I'm overwhelmed with thinking about the number of journeys and circumstances that collide for this, this very moment. And so I don't want this to be an individual experience. I want you to know who uh, is surrounding you. Um, and some of you today uh, are here because your life circumstances have led you to feel like you're essentially living in a perpetual Friday without a Sunday coming. You're stuck, right? You're buried in grief, death without resurrection. Maybe you've been debilitated by sickness by hurt, by loss. You've been living in a state of hopelessness, loneliness for a while. And the weight of life, maybe for you, it's heavy, it's constant. And today you're here because you're desperate for the nearness of God. That's legitimate. I'm glad you came. And like some days like this that are kind of upbeat can be harder to come to because everybody else seems so happy, but you're going through it. I'm glad you're here. For some of you, what keeps you from experiencing hope in Jesus is doubt. You come with deep skepticism and and that's been the case for a long time. Doubt that he's even there. The belief that God has not made himself known to you. So you just frankly don't believe in him. And his perceived absence has led to your indifference about him. And this is maybe just a family tradition, right? I'm glad you're here. For others of you, your obstacle to hope is how you believe that God sees you. Because of maybe the mistakes you've made over the course of your life. You believe that your mistakes disqualify you from being deserving of any love or grace. You think Man, there can't be a God with enough grace to cover what, what I've done in my lifetime, and so shame is your great weight that you've been walking around with. You believe God is too disappointed in you to offer you his love. Well, my hope and prayer for all of us today, don't miss this, it's not that we suppress or deny our circumstances, embrace whatever reality you're walking in. It's not that we ignore our doubts or our mistakes, right? The message is not just forget about it and get over it. My hope is that we embrace our realities, our doubts, and even our mistakes that we have made as the very things that are going to propel us to experience the fullness of hope in Christ. I want you to be able to say this. Psalm 119, the psalmist wrote, For you, Lord, have delivered me from death my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. See, the psalmist is recalling a time when his life was shaken, but at the same time was able to experience rest in God. As long as we live in a broken, fractured world, life is going to be hard. And so the goal is not to get over it and live your best life now. It's to embrace all that life brings to you. And live out that dichotomy of in the midst of it all, we can truly find peace, rest, and hope in Christ. Someone once said, the presence of doubt and fear does not prove the absence of trust. Let me say that one more time. The presence of doubt and fear, which is legitimate for all of us, does not prove the absence of trust. What do, what do we mean by that? Pay attention to your longing. Pay attention to your desire for more. Even though we're all navigating different journeys and circumstances, you know what unites every single one of us? That deep down longing for more. As we live our lives and experience hurt and brokenness and sickness, all of us intuitively know this can't be it. And even a step further, when you live your best life now, you get all you, you hope to get in life. Your needs, wants, and desires met. Climbing the corporate ladder. You have all the stuff and you're, you still feel incomplete. Why is that? Could it be that there is nothing in this world that could fully satisfy our deepest longing in our soul? So pay attention to that desire. It doesn't mean that you are far from God. Absolutely not. It is the very thing, right? Your doubts and your fears that are prepared to propel you 
to greater connection to Christ. So I want us to consider today how we can experience this closeness, this connection with God in the midst of our circumstances, whatever they may be, in the midst of our doubt, in the midst of our disappointment, in the midst of our mistakes. And what we're going to see in the specific resur resurrection account we're going to read about today is the importance of awe and wonder when encountering Christ. The importance of awe and wonder before encountering Christ. Before we get there, though, I want us to think for just a second about the natural loss of wonder as we grow up. It's interesting that we are, this God-given wonder that we have, we see at such a young age. Our daughter Millie just turned three last week, and for Emily and I both, our favorite age for Levi, who's now five, and, and Millie, now three, was age two because everything's entertaining. Like, you just sit back and watch the show. Every single thing that they try to say, right, is, is hilarious in everything that they see and experience. And so Millie going to the beach for the first time, seeing and hearing the ocean, the, the, her toes in the sand. Uh, whenever she sees a dog, uh, she runs for it, not knowing that every, not every dog wants to have a two-year-old run to it. Uh, and we don't even know where that comes from. We don't have a dog. Her fascination for, with dogs is a total mystery to us, but it's been going on for the last year and a half. She even has a hat that says, can I pet your dog? <laughs> Millie running down the sidewalk, right? It's pure joy. Smelling candles, right? If you bring a candle to our two, now three-year-old, like she'll just think that's the greatest thing in the world, right? We, hopefully she doesn't set her house on fire one day. She's fascinated with candles. <laughs> Eating marshmallows, like that's a highlight. She just discovered peeps for the first time last week. That just blew her mind. Like, wait, that's, that's an actual thing? Biting the head of a bunny on <laughs> Drinking ginger ale for the first time. This is too good not to show you a video. Check out Millie drinking ginger ale for the very first time. It was a few months ago. <laughs> She's got to wash it down with some water. She's not sure about going back for more. <laughs> there it is. I get better than that. <laughs> Now, we all know that's the miracle of carbonation, right? She's like, what is happening in my mouth right now? I'm not sure, but I just know that I like it, right? But there's enthusiasm in every action, right? The joy of the simple, the ordinary. But we all know, right, those of us that are older than two or three years old today, a sense of wonder gets squeezed out over time as we grow up and things become familiar, right? And the new's not new anymore and we have this constant desire for the next new thing, bigger and better, the extravagant. And in a day and age where we're incapable, really, of embracing boredom, our norms have kind of become skewed, right? We're addicted to comfort, to pleasure, to euphoria. In the joy of gratitude that was once found in the simple gifts of ordinary, everyday life, frankly, they've been replaced by this numbness of entitlement. Our norms are skewed. All that to say, I think we've become a little ho-hum about a dead man coming back to life. So this is not a historical event, right? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is personal because his resurrection meant resurrection for you. And so our joy should be exceeding every year. Now, four writers in Scripture, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, detail Jesus' resurrection and they each have different perspectives and details, but one element that's common in each of them is this sense of wonder, astonishment, and surprise. And I think the invitation to us today is the same. And, and again, I know not everybody comes every Sunday, but what I love about gathering weekly is kind of this sanctuary away, this escape from our, our devices, right? This might be the slowest, most empty space when it comes to what we give our attention to all week. Our digital disconnected and distracted age, it's easier than ever to kind of sleepwalk through life, numb to the reality of what God is up to all around us and in us, and we miss the joy in the ordinary. So there, what we're going to see are two essential elements, I believe, to encountering the living Christ that lead us to live like we're actually alive, and cultivating this discipline of paying attention to what he's doing around us and in us. So Matthew, the gospel writer, shows us Mary Magdalene and a, another woman that he names the other Mary. They make this early Sunday morning visit to the tomb in which on late Friday afternoon, they had just watched Joseph of Arimathea place Jesus' crucified body. Deep moment of grief represents finality. And as they approach the tomb, 
The ground suddenly shakes under their feet, an earthquake, followed by a blaze of lightning, which turns out to be an angel. And the combination of earthquake and lightning puts the Roman soldiers who were guarding the tomb at the time out of commission, literally on the ground, that they're so, they're so scared, they fall to the ground. But this is interesting, the two Marys, on the other hand, stay on their feet, hear the angel, then say to them, do not be afraid. He has risen. <laughs> Imagine that moment. The angel then tells them to go tell Jesus' disciples that he's risen. And then as they're going, they're stopped in their tracks by Jesus himself. Here we go, Matthew 28, verse 8. The women naturally ran quickly from the tomb. They were, notice this, very frightened, like what in the world, but also filled with great joy. The message version says deep in wonder and full of joy. And scripture says they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, unbelievable visual, grasped his feet and worshiped him. They fell to their knees before the resurrected Jesus. So two specific responses that we see that I think are necessary for us today. The first response was odd reverence. Odd reverence. Like this is the one that we've known that is apparently greater than anybody we've ever known. And could it be true that he has accomplished what he said that he would? But the other response, there's this also an, an intimacy to the response as they they dared to touch and hold on to his feet. Right? Keep in mind the emotion that they're navigating. Right? They're frightened. There's, there's fear, but there's also joy. This collision of these two elements. Reverence and intimacy. Reverence, like this, you're the king of kings. You are like none other. But intimacy, you are the one who loves me. Not a king who, is, who reigns above and is distant. No, a king who draws near, comes to us, and they recognize as the one who loves them, pursues them. Reverence, intimacy are the essence of worship, the necessary approaches of God, to God if we're going to walk in hope with him. Do you know this kind of God? A God greater than anything we could ever know, but also a God who draws us near. So let me break this down a little bit further because I think that we can all, as we navigate faith, can go one way or another in this journey. Falling to our knees before Jesus is an act of reverence, but it isn't in and of itself resurrection worship. Acknowledgement of a king, right? We, we can do that in everyday life, whatever, fill in the blank, you know, celebrity or person of authority. You're like, whoa, if I saw them, like, okay, wow. The immediate reverence. Acknowledgement of a king, but not of a father who also draws near. However, touching and holding the feet of Jesus, that's an act of intimacy, but isn't in itself resurrection worship because Jesus is more than just your buddy or your best friend or somebody that you're, you're, you're into. Like, oh, I'm in, Jesus is cool, so I'm going to go to Easter service, right? Sometimes we're way too casual about the person of Jesus. See, reverence without closeness is mere admi admiration. Like, yeah, I'm a fan of Jesus. Yeah, it's just like a, a compartment in your life. Like, yeah, he's, he's a big deal. I'm a fan of him. Closeness without reverence is mere emotion kind of the sensationalism. Sometimes we can be chasing right, a certain uh, emotion because we believe that whatever it is that we feel must be real. It's evidence that something worthwhile and purposeful is actually happening. Like even today, like I could probably pull out some, some big tearjerker story. It's like, I'm crying today. Therefore, this must be meaningful. I'm not saying right, emotions matter. God gave us the ability to feel deeply, but sometimes we chase that because we feel like that that deep emotion reflects something tangible. However, the combined acts of reverence and intimacy reflect a deep longing for connection with God. These women knew the gravity of the moment. They were dealing with God in the living presence of Jesus, and so they naturally were compelled to draw near and worship. Now, again, it's also interesting to reflect on the difference between the Roman guards sprawled on the ground and, the and they were paralyzed by fear, and the two women kneeling on the same ground energized or motivated by fear, right? So this is that moment, kind of personal examination. The spirit does his own work because all of us can navigate this in different ways. Sometimes pe uh, fear can just uh, paralyze us and knock us down and keep us uh, from living life. And other times it can motivate us to find greater life. Matthew 28, verse four, the guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. One translation says they became as dead men. Then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid, he said, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Big difference. Romans, 
Roman soldiers, they're done, right? Well, he's gone. We're just here doing our job. The women, they know there has to be something more. They're looking for Jesus. So there's a fear that can paralyze us, fear of the unknown, fear of punishment, fear of suffering, fear of making mistakes. These are paralyzing fears that really keep us from living, where we reduce our lives to the American dream. We just want, and these are some of our, not, you know, we, I can tend to pray for this as well. We just want our lives to be safe and comfortable and everything go well. And then we arrive safely at death one day in, in reunion with Jesus, right? But it can, we, we fail to live life to the full as Jesus had in mind. And this is, this is the kind of fear that can even reduce a person's relationship with God to merely religion, right? Where we, we reduce our life to a list of do's and don'ts to satisfy our conscience, but it's a life lacking actual life that comes from a walking everyday relationship with a loving father. It ends up being a life without wonder. Life is kind of this self-help project. And the result ends up being either self-righteousness through following the rules. I don't know about you. I feel pretty good when I have a good day and I'm nice to people and don't make a lot of mistakes. Instinctively, I'm like, oh, God must be proud of me today, right? And so that can lead to a life of self-righteousness. Or on the flip side, feelings of inadequacy or unworthiness. Whenever rules are broken, if I have a bad day, it's like, oh, man, God is not happy with me today. He must be distant from me. That's an exhausting cycle of moral workaholism. That's not how God operates. But there's also a righteous fear that pulls us out of our preoccupation with ourselves, our feelings, our our circumstances, into a world of wonder where we don't have to have all the answers, a world that keeps us in touch with the very presence and purpose of God. This is what the phrase fear of the Lord actually means. This respect and reverence, right? It's a righteous fear of the one who is holy, but also the one who pours out his love to us. In Scripture, the word fear means more than simply being scared. It includes all the emotions that come from being scared, disorientation, not knowing what's going to happen, the ultimate realization that there is far more here than we had any idea of. See, Millie drinking that ginger ale and the women encountering an empty tomb, their mindset, I don't fully understand what's happening, but one thing I know for sure, it's good, and I'm going to tell somebody about it. And so we don't just wait to have all of the answers before we uh, prepare ourselves, seemingly so, to live the kind of life that's worth living. No, faith is going God's way, even though I don't have all of the answers. A paralyzing fear causes us to live life essentially with closed hands, attempting to hold tightly to our one and only life, to possess all that we can while we can, attempting to live out the illusion that we are in control of our life. It's It's a scarcity mentality, isn't it? I have to get all that I can while I can. I have to live my good life now. Living with a righteous fear, on the other hand, is a life lived with open hands. Understanding we are not the center of the universe, we are not actually in control of our lives, and we cannot obtain the fullness of life on our own. And knowing that, we're content at the same time not being the one who has to live or sit on the throne of our lives. So again, this is, this, is, this is different for every single one of us. But for all of us, we need to ask the question, who's running your life? Who's running your life? Several years ago, my wife's uh, uh, grandma decided that she was going to part with this radio record player, this bulky thing that she uh, wanted to get out of her garage and said, I thought, well, that's a pretty cool thing. I think we'll take it to our house. She said she wasn't sure if it worked or not, so my idealistic, optimistic self thought I could just plug it in and everything would be perfect. And so we took it home, I plugged it in, and that was not the case. The thing you need to know about these hands, my hands specifically, are incapable of fixing most things. (laughs) I'm secure enough to share that with however many people are here on Easter Sunday. That's just the reality. I have good friends that are good at helping me. And so I quickly realized, especially when we were going to move to another house several years ago, that we're not going to hold on to this. We're going to try to put it in the right hand, someone who can maybe do something worthwhile with it. So we found that person, and a couple days later, here's what that person uh, messaged us. They said, I just want you to know I'm up and jamming to the radio. Grandma's radio record player will always be cherished and loved. It's already polished, too. Thank you. Now, what's the difference between a broken record player and a working record player? Whether or not it's in the right hands. Because as long as it's in my hands, it's broken and dead probably forever. But in a moment, as soon as it finds the right hands, it comes to life and is played in its original intent. It certainly can't fix itself, and neither can we. 
The point is, and this is the case for all of us, right, regardless of your faith journey, you expect change. You want growth. You desire transformation, restoration. But you need to, it will never come through a self-improvement plan. You can't read enough books. You can't hear enough how, uh, seven steps to your better life messages to improve yourself to the place of life to the full. Transformation will only come through dependency on the author of your life. And God's plan for your life is like a record player that plays like it's brand new. Restored to your original intent. This is for everybody. Nobody's left out. This is the meaning of Easter for you. It's personal. But you see, the first step, though, to finding life is admitting we are dead. Admitting that we are broken and we can't do anything about it. Karl Barth once said, only where graves are is their resurrection. Eugene Peterson took it one step further. He said, we practice our death by giving up our will to live on our own terms. Easier said than done, huh? See, for the record player to work, I had to give it up. To find life, we must give up on trying to run our own life. So all that to say, again, all of us coming from different places in life, don't let your doubt keep you from God. Doubt often looks like a greater belief in myself in my own competence than belief in God's strength. I can't let that keep me from God. He wants me to leverage that to propel him to closer connection to him. For others of you, maybe you think your past mistakes define you, and unfortunately you've had people in your life speak lies into your life about your value. Maybe you think your past mistakes define you, even prevent you from being deserving of any kind of love. Well, you, you're not leaving here today without hearing this truth. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when Jesus went to the cross and he thought about the kind of life that you were going to live, he didn't imagine you eventually pulling yourself together, getting to a place of confidence where you were deserving of the kind of life that is dying on a cross. No, he knew how your life would go, how all of us would go off the rails, and he went to that cross anyway, while we were still sinners. Your brokenness does not determine your worth and purpose. Your worth is defined by the one who came to pick up the pieces, who went to the cross, rose from the grave to make you whole. Jesus' resurrection gets to be your resurrection. Don't let shame drive your life because the reality is that the very act of embracing our brokenness, don't miss this, the very act of embracing our brokenness is the very thing that propels us to receive God's unbelievable grace that empowers us. If your cup is full and you're competent and you're standing on your own two feet and you're running your life and you see no need for God, there's no room for God in your life. Because here's what Paul said, 2 Corinthians 12, uh, Jesus, or Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Why? For my power is made perfect in weakness. So first time guests, don't, don't even begin to think that you're surrounded by super professional Christians where we've gone to church long enough, we got it together, we've arrived, and, and we're good to go. No, you actually might be more ready recipients of God's grace because you're embracing your weakness. You think your, your bad decisions and your brokenness are what keep you far from God, but in fact, it's the very thing that makes you more ready for Him than ever before. Sometimes our confidence and self-righteousness and trying to play religion is what actually keeps us distant from God. Now, when, when Paul talks about power, what kind of power are we talking about? This is important to know. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is unbelievable. This is the same mighty power, he says, that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So the New Testament is written in Greek, and so the word used here for power is the word dunamis, is it's, the, it's where we get our word dynamite. Don't, this is crazy. It's the same word used when referring to the power behind Jesus' miracles, and it's the same power that raised him from the dead. So let's be clear today. This is not just about power over death later, but power meant for the fullness of your life today. The Holy Spirit residing within you empowers you to live a life you could never live on your own. Romans chapter 6, 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. We also, brand new. So you might have a long list of mistakes. Maybe people in your life have said, wow, it's, you've, there's no hope for you. 
you keep repeating the same pattern of sin, pa same pattern of behavior, right? You're your own worst enemy. You keep going off the rails. Well, there is no list in God's eyes when you walk with Jesus and you have the supernatural power that can overcome anything and make you brand new. I came across a, a story, technically a 200-year-old true story that I'd never heard before. Maybe some of you historians have. That was pretty crazy. Check this out. One of the most bizarre Supreme Court cases of all time took place in 1833. It was called United States versus Wilson. The defendant, George Wilson, pled guilty to several counts of robbery and the attempted murder of a mail driver. These crimes were punishable by death, and Wilson was sentenced to death by hanging. President Andrew Jackson at the time, however, for reasons unknown to us, the author says, issued George Wilson a full pardon. But then Wilson, also for reasons unknown to us, refused the pardon and demanded to pay for his crimes. The warden told Wilson that he couldn't execute him because he'd been pardoned by the President of the United States. But Wilson refused the pardon and contested the issue in court. This guy's nuts, right? <laughs> what are you doing, man? I hope he doesn't have any family, poor, poor people. The odd case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and this was the Supreme Court's verdict. Here's what it says. A pardon is an act of grace which exempts the individual on whom it is bestowed from the punishment the law inflicts for a crime he has committed. A pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential and delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected, and if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in a court to force it on him. So George Wilson was executed with a presidential pardon sitting on the warden's desk. Dude, what are you doing? I don't know. But here's the point. A pardon is only valid if it's received. God has extended the pardon to you, every single one of you. But you're free to reject it. This offer is free. It's personal. He had you in mind. This is big love. It's intentional love coming your way. And so know today, don't miss this, know today that it is neither your doubts nor your sins that will keep you from heaven or from living life to the full today. It's your refusal to believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord and receive his pardon that will. People who go to heaven usually have heads filled with questions and lives scarred with sin, but they go because they have their hearts set on Jesus. They recognized the one who hung on that cross was Savior, and the one who got up out of that grave is Lord. Stop trying to stand on your own. Perfection is unattainable. I'm sure there's a lot of successful people here today, and that's great. But it is only through the grace and love of Jesus that we can experience any life of significance. Romans chapter 10 is as clear as it gets. Verse 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, meaning made right with God. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So again, don't let your circumstance, don't let your doubt, don't let your sin keep you from experiencing closeness with Christ. Leverage it. Look it full in the face and give it over to God. Open hands. God, my day, my life is yours. Full surrender. Life's hard. Life is hard, but we have hope because the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. His resurrection means your resurrection today. May you come to know and love the one who loved you first and gave his life so that you could live today. The band at each camp is going to come forward and sing a song that I just want us to let these words fall on you. It's a celebratory song where we just need to claim it. Claim that Jesus has come for you. Here's a few of the lyrics. Behold the king, light of the world, lamb that was slain, lion who rose, mighty to save, the fullness of God won't be kept in a grave. Darkness, your hour is over. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for the work that you do in our lives, even when we don't realize it. And that if there is anybody here walking in darkness and they can't see their way out because of their circumstances or because of the lies that they've been told by the people around them, I pray that they rise above it and claim your truth about how you see them and the life you want for them. God, you are the way, the truth, 
and the life through Jesus, your son, that you sent to die on a cross for our sins and who conquered the grave. God, I pray for newness of life for every single person today, that we run hard after you. And as we trip along the way, we just keep getting up and chasing you down, knowing that you're carrying us through this hard life and that we can, pass, we can experience the peace that passes understanding on the way to experiencing life forever with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.